John, we're going to have Billy Epler join us, and I guess we get to ask him a bunch of questions. Yeah, very interesting offseason coming for them. They went five for five in free agency the last offseason. This year they have seven free agents of their own, starting with DeGrom, with Nimmo and Diaz, and a big, big winter for Billy Epler and the Mets. Yeah, it's hard to go five for five one offseason. They're going to have to do really well to keep that 100-win team. We'll talk to him about how he plans to do that. We'll talk about free agency in large, and we'll also talk about the 118th World Series on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. Welcome to the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. And if you're doing the video portion of this on Yes or YouTube or wherever you might find us, uh, you'll notice I'm, if you could read the background, I'm in Philadelphia. John is home in Miami. Uh, we're doing this from different locales. I'm here for the World Series, John. Two games have been played so far as we're recording this. Game three was postponed is, again, when we're recording that, game three is tonight. So why don't we deal with the known portion of our program? That's games one and two. What have you thought of the 118th World Series to date? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. I do think the World Series is unpredictable, as I've said many times on this uh, program, that uh, seven games, five games, very difficult to predict. It's one of the reasons I went with the Phillies, uh, not only because we had Rob Thompson on last week as our guest, uh, I thought they were the hot team and uh, that plays. Uh, part of that unpredictability is the pitching. I mean, the three best pitchers probably in the series, Verlander and the two guys from Philly, Wheeler and Nola, were the ones who were hit hard. Nobody else has really hit much. So we haven't seen a lot of hitting, but the hitting we have seen has come against an all-time great and two all-star caliber pitchers. So very unpredictable, and we shouldn't be surprised about that. Yeah, and with all that said, John, and it, look, who knows what will happen in the next couple of days here uh, as we stretch into November now for the, uh, you know, the great October festival that is the World Series. But uh, the, the Astros are 8-1, and one, and after the second game of the division series, they got very little – from Jordan Alvarez until the last game, they had gotten very little from Altuve. I think of those two guys as the engines of their offense. Those guys were six for 30 with no RBI in the four game sweep against the Yankees. If I would have told the Yankees before that series began, those two guys will go six for 30 with no RBI. They go, well, we're going to finally beat them. And they didn't. And I just wonder if those two guys get hot at all. How does Philly handle this, especially with what feels like a compromised wheeler, right? He's being pushed back another day if this thing uh, gets to a, a, a game six. And with the reality that they clearly are trying to run away from Noah Syndergaard or, and Kyle Gibson and might in certain situ situations have to use them both in uh, prominent roles. So I just wonder about length of pitching and what happens if Alvarez and Altuve get hot. Yeah, I mean, I, I actually think the rain out played in Philly's favor. Um, you know, we remember Noah in New York throwing 100 miles an hour. He isn't that guy anymore. Ranger Suarez has been a terrific pitcher for them throughout the regular season, throughout the postseason. He did a great job in relief earlier in this series. Uh, so I, I thought that actually helped Philly. Um, you know, when some sometimes when a guy's cold, and Jordan Alvarez, one of the best hitters in baseball, he could stay cold. Um, Altuve... Uh, you know, they're not going to react very well to Altuve in Philly, as I wrote well, about. Well, we've uh, seen when he doesn't get that. reacted well yeah. to in New York, he goes off, right? Yeah, you know, so. right, exactly. He may, uh, if he performs like he does against the Yankees in New York, uh, it's going to be a big boost. Houston is still a great team, even with Alvarez and Altuve not performing. Bregman is a great, not only postseason player, he's a great player. I think he was... Uh, injuries had limited him for a little bit while he's back to what he was and their pitching top to bottom is incredible. I mean, I mean, mentioned Verlander, but from Valdez, who they've got now conspiracy theories in Philly pitched so well, they thought they saw something, something going on there. I mean, to really me, follow the Astros, don't they, John? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, but I can understand that to a degree. Obviously 2017 was an ugly episode and, and I get it. And I do expect the Philly fans to, behave as Philly fans do. I was just, you know, being hopeful and uh, I've been shouted down on, in Philly uh, quite heavily. I don't think I've ever written a story that I know I shouldn't look, but the uh, 
dimensions were double. I guess they call that ratio of the uh, likes. So um, I get it. They're going to treat Altuve as he's treated it in Yankee Stadium, maybe even a little bit worse, and he may respond to that. But, I mean, Houston has great pitching, whether it's Valdez, Javier, McCullers with all those curveballs. I mean, they've turned Montero into an outstanding pitcher. Neris, who had been in Philly, has even has been even better for Houston. Uh, I don't know. They have the magic formula when it comes to pitching, and that is obviously a key. This has been a low-scoring uh, postseason with very low batting averages, with few exceptions. Obviously, Bregman's been very good. The Philly offense has been better than the other offenses generally, but it's going to be low-scoring, and uh, that probably plays in Houston's favor. So, John, they were obviously the team that eliminated the Yankees. They've done that four times since 2015, three times in the ALCS since 2017, the last two times with Aaron Boone as the manager of the Yankees. In the last week, Hal Steinbrenner leaving the Yankee complex in Tampa told the Associated Press that he's planning on bringing Boone back. I assume if he's bringing Boone back, that means he's bringing Cashman back. Why would you not have both of them? Uh, do you think this is the right way to go? Should should both guys be back? Specifically, why don't we focus on Boone since the yeah. the, the uh, owner of the team who doesn't reply to any of my requests for interviews <laughs> were, gave one on the way out of the ballpark. He's really gone underground. Yeah, you're not alone there, Joel. He's not responding to anybody, I'm sure. Um, yeah, Boone is the controversy. Yeah, there's no controversy over Cashman. He's obviously been there a long time. He's won four World Series. Uh, he said incredible string of basically a generation of playoff appearances. So, I mean, Cashman is really not the controversy. Some fans I'm sure would like to see him replaced that. I don't see how that could happen and it's not going to happen. Uh, Boone was the controversy. That controversy is over as well. We knew it would be, we, we knew that they would bring him back. They love him. Uh, Cashman loves him. Steinbrenner loves him. And I think, Part of the equation is that the players love him. I went around that clubhouse after they were eliminated and you, you couldn't even find someone hesitating at all. And that's rare when it comes to a manager. So I think it would have upset the clubhouse and uh, probably would have been a big gamble. I get where the fans stand. They've said their MO is to not only get to the World Series, to win the World Series. Well, they haven't done it five years running with him as the manager so I, I understand why this is a controversy. My opinion, as I've written in the post, is they need to hire someone on that bench, whether it be the bench coach or somebody else to be his Don Zimmer. I've suggested Larry Boa would be great. Manager in two places, incredible experience. I think he needs his Don Zimmer, like Joe Torre had, who can really impress upon him the urgency of the situation in October. I give him a pass on... Uh, in game three in Cleveland when he didn't bring in Holmes because he's very sympathetic to injury. I get it. But to have uh, twice Clark Schmidt be on the mound and basically give up the losing hit twice and then to go again with Trevino uh, in the key moment, bases loaded nobody out instead of leaving in Garrett Cole, who's your best pitcher, or bringing in Loisaga, your best reliever. That Probably was not the right thing to do. And I think he needs somebody. There's a lot going on in these games. He needs a Larry Boa type. I, that would be my opinion because I, I just didn't believe there was any chance he was going to get fired looking at the entire situation. Yeah, I think that uh, there's that the uh, 162 games and the sprint in the postseason are need different kind of managing styles. You mentioned it, uh, that sense of urgency. And one of the things I've written a few times is it's, uh, so I think this should be like Second City Television, Upright Citizens Brigade. The best improvisational artists are the best managers at this time of year. And those guys who are great imp at improvisation, they spend thousands and thousands of hours before they get on the stage practicing their craft. And then when they get on the stage, though, they got to feel, what kind of audience do I have tonight? What kind of scene partner do I have tonight? What is the audience going to yell out as the scene? And then they have to react to that using their skills. To me... Aaron Boone and his staff are scripting a game at three o'clock in the afternoon and sticking to that script, even when they get new information from the game. Lou Trevino seems like a great idea for the bottom of the order at three o'clock in the afternoon. But how about when the runner on second is possibly the end of your season? You can't bring in your fourth best reliever in that situation. And he did that. You know, you had a choice. Your best pitcher is Cole and your best relievers are home and Loa Saiga. 
Who do you want to use out of that group of three? Lou Trevino can't be in that conversation. And I think this is those kind of things have now happened in five postseasons in a row where there is not that sense of the, the whole season. This is like 162 games in one. So I'm with you. Like, there needs to be some human capital to kind of turn to Aaron Boone and go, Aaron, deep breath. This is the big moment right now. What are we going to do in this big moment? Not June 17th, not July 26th. Right now, October something or November something. So I'm with you on that. Yeah, I mean, it was an elimination game and you have to behave that way. Uh, you know, obviously they what, they had the inspiration of the uh, collapse in 2004. That probably wasn't, that wasn't Boone's doing. That was a, a mistake too. But um, yeah, I, I, I just couldn't foresee them firing Boone and I get it. The players love him. He's great at almost all aspects of the job, but he's still a work in progress when it comes to these elimination games, these playoff games. They did win two against Cleveland, which they should have been able to beat Cleveland. And they did, they got through that, but then to get swept, you know, that is not good. You know, uh, back in 17, uh, you know, they took, the, the Astros to seven games. The Astros were cheating and they took them to seven games here. We assume the Astros are playing on the up and up and they got swept. So they're moving in the wrong direction over those six years. And, uh, you know, they could not slay the dragon. And I think they didn't approach the dragon the right way either. So, you know, there has to be adjustments. And even within that series, it seemed like Bregman was the guy who was going to be tough. And yet, it seemed like they couldn't stop worrying about Alvarez. Maybe that's natural. Maybe that was the right thing to do. Alvarez looked to me like he was being beaten on a 97, every 96, 97, which is most of the fastballs. He was being beaten on all of them. And they were pitching around him to get to Bregman still. I didn't think that was probably the right thing. I think you're right. They need to adjust in the moment and they have not done that. And uh, they do need to make some adjustments. I do think to either give somebody else some more power on that coaching staff or, bring in somebody, veteran guy. Zimmer was the perfect guy for Torrey, although Torrey had managed how many, three places previously, I think, right? Three and hadn't worked out. Uh, you know, Torrey was great at all other aspects of the job. And I think Boone is, and, and we had Rob Thompson on too. And interestingly, Thompson has captured the moment. I mean, to bring in Suarez when he did, perfect thing. He brought in, and now he can come back with them as it turns out, game three, and, uh, I mean, it would have been hard to project that. Thompson told us that he thought Boone was the right hire due to the media reasons. And, you know, Thompson's fine with the media. I get it. Boone was at ESPN. Um, you know, I, I understand it. And I didn't expect Boone to be let go, but they do need to make some adjustment. They can't come back with exactly the same cast of characters and exactly the same plan. John, uh, I wonder if we could go quickly here because we have Billy Epler coming up next. Uh, free agency will have started by the time we do our show next. Boy, life comes at you fast, right? By the time we do this next week, we'll both be at the general manager's meetings. We'll begin. There's hundreds of free agents. I wonder, I'm going to just throw it out and say free agency. What's the biggest thing on your mind as free agency begins? Oh, Aaron Judge is the biggest thing. The Yankees better bring him back. And uh, they're certainly going to make a big effort, at least in their way of thinking. And I, we think that the likelihood is that, well, they're concerned, certainly. And you hear rumors of the Giants doing anything they can, which I don't believe. Nobody does anything they can. There's Everybody's got a limit. They're going to try for Judge. I don't believe the hometown is any kind of a lure. I do think the stadium is a disincentive for him to go there. It's very difficult in home runs to right field there. And overall, it's like 20th or so in home run factor. Yankee Stadium is around fifth. I do think he's comfortable. I do think Aaron Boone will probably come back as a Yankee. Now we'll do the show a few months from now, and maybe I'll be wrong, but He's number one, but it's it's quite an interesting market with the seven Mets free agents, with the Grom, with Verlander, uh, with Turner. We got four excellent shortstops again. We'll see if there's a clamoring for the Yankees to try to sign one of them again, as there was last year, and they didn't do it. I don't think they're going to do it again, but they do need to get judged. I wonder, John, if the success of the Phillies going with stars – and paying stars, what John Middleton and the Phillies did, is going to encourage some teams at the top of the market to be bold and say stars do make a difference. And since we always talk about Yankees and Mets, I will say, I think this World Series, 
And the Phillies being here is very good for Trey Turner. I think it's going to be a really good market for him. And I think a team like, let's use an example, like the Cardinals that have kind of like pushed and pushed, but it's been a while since they've gotten here. I could see them making a really big play for Turner. By the way, I could see the Phillies doing, I could see a lot of teams. I think this is a good World Series for the top of the free agent market. Yeah, I think teams are going to spend. Uh, we don't know Texas is. We think San Francisco is. Obviously, the Dodgers always spend. The Cubs have said they're going to spend. I believe it when I see it. Uh, it's going to be great for Turner. We have Bogertz and Correa aren't officially free agents. They will opt out. So you'll have those three great shortstops, plus Dansby Swanson. Uh, obviously, the Dodgers need to get one of them. It's going to be interesting to see how they handle it. There is word that Turner would prefer to be on the East Coast, prefer to have spring training in Florida. He is from Florida. His wife is from New Jersey. Philadelphia does make sense. Rookie Stott has done a great job at shortstop. They could move him over to second. Segura has been a very good contributor there as well. So we'll see what Philly ends up doing. I do think you're right. Uh, this isn't the only time this has happened. The, the Nats were a big spending, um, say, upper mid-market team that won with a top-heavy team with Scherzer and Strasburg and Rendon and they won the World Series that way obviously Philly is in the World Series that way their free agent signings have been unbelievably great uh, and maybe not five for five like the Mets did in the winter but uh, last winter but pretty pretty darn good Wheeler who they got from the Mets Harper fantastic Schwarber incredible uh, Castellanos jury's still out but he's contributing to a World Series team Arietta was the one miss over the last few years on free agency, but you know, you can build a team this way. I know a lot of GMs want to show you how smart they are and build from within and get a great bargain here and there. But I mean, I think we knew Bryce Harper was going to contribute. I don't think you miss on free agents when you go for a Bryce Harper or a Greg Maddox. I'm going back a few years now, that type of player, an Aaron judge, a Turner, a Correa. I do think it's interesting the debate. The Correa-Turner debate, I see more people saying Turner is going to do better. You know, I'm looking at the numbers, and I, I don't – you seem to feel that way. I don't see it that way. I think Correa will probably be the top of the market, but we'll see how it plays out. Free agency, very unpredictable. Last time with his shortstops, we saw Seager got 325. We saw Correa, Correa have to get a one-year deal. We saw other shortstops in between, but it's going to be interesting to see how that shortstop market plays out too. Well, we're certainly going to talk about the Mad Free Agents and so much more with Billy Epler, who joins us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman next. Welcome back to the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. Our guest is the general manager of the New York Mets, Billy Epler, who I'm sure wishes we weren't doing this today because he would want to be part of the World Series as, a part, as opposed to part of this podcast. But Billy, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, and I guess... The place to start is you're not in the playoffs. Uh, that's been a few weeks now. What does the general manager of the Mets begin to do once the season is done? Is this all coaches, human resources, because you know the flood of free agency and trades is coming, or are you already prioritizing free agency? Tell us what these couple of weeks where you're not playing, what what's that what that is entailed. Yeah, sure. Um so, you know, once your season's kind of declared itself and you're, and you're not playing anymore, you know, the, the priority then turns to, you know, your, your personnel, um, your coaching personnel, scouting, development, front office, uh, performance. That can be anything from athletic trainers, strength, conditioning, personnel. So this so is everybody that encompasses baseball operations from in uniform to out of uniform and you know, at that at that time, you you sit back with the the department heads. You reflect. Um, you ask them about you know the uh, you know the any changes or anything that they would like to to do to enhance their you know their particular objectives and 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 have those discussions and then start executing. Um, and uh, you know, so talk to Buck about you know staff, and then you know I would talk to um, you know Tommy regarding scouting, Tommy Tanis regarding scouting personnel and. Um, just kind of round out uh, a lot of those conversations and, and get that underway simultaneously, you know, you're having discussions with your, you know, player personnel and, and scouting and, and analytics groups regarding roster construction, what a depth chart looks like. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I like to do and, and how we want to manage, you know, the depth here is, you know, looking at the major league team, but also looking at triple A 
um, and then even double A because you know that's our our kind of most um, most available kind of pool of talent as we you know as we you know get the season underway. So we want to make sure that we have you know a, a good amount of inventory um, there should we you know run into some injuries and need to make transactions. So you're balancing those discussions and kind of strategy sessions. You're balancing the you know the uh, the employee relations aspect. Um, of the job and and you're also talking to some of your current um you know or pending free agents so to speak and so uh, you know we, we're juggling all of those things but uh yeah october is definitely a definitely a busy month um you know but like you said we'd rather be playing no doubt uh but uh when um uh, when that declares itself then you have to get uh get down to business um on the other side billy thank you so much for joining us really appreciate it you mentioned the free agents briefly Obviously, you guys did fantastic last winter with free agency. I think you basically went five for five. Not many people do that. A lot of people are leery about free agency because some of the uh, contracts end up being very large and the players don't always uh, play as they did before they signed that contract. Yours did, even starting with Adovino, but certainly with the big ones, Scherzer was great, Marte, uh, Escobar, and then, of course, you traded, I believe it was no, Cano was a signing also. So you really went five for five in free agency. So I'm sure there's a ton to do, but uh, you've got seven prime free agents this year. Where do you stand with these guys right now? I'm sure you've prioritized them. Uh, is there any hope to sign any of them up before they declare officially for free agency? I know that's difficult and probably not that likely, but I should ask. Yeah, I mean, to to your point, it's you know it's it's hard to execute that, um, you know, especially when you're enough, you know, a few days um, or you know maybe a week away from from the start of of that free agency period, and so um, that can be a little bit more difficult to do. But we have been in touch with some of our group. Um, not going to get into the specifics of the who's and um, and you know not going to handicap the likelihood that anything gets done in advance of, of free agency but um, you know a lot of the a lot of the players know where we stand um, and uh, and I've had you know some conversations with uh, you know with the, the people on their side um, and uh, you know we'll see but you know they understand what we need to do um, this winter time the number of uh, you know kind of holes that we have you know, opening up on our, uh, on our roster, both in the rotation and the pen and, and, and on the position player side as well. So um, they, you know, I think that the best thing that you can do in my chair is, is communicate and uh, be very transparent with that, uh, you know, with your, with your players um, and let them know what, what you need to accomplish and, and uh, you know, kind of, you know, kind of cast the, you know, cast the scene for them um, so that they have a, a thorough understanding and uh, you know, but communication is key. Billy, I wonder if I could drill down on one specific free agent, and that's probably your biggest one. That's Jacob deGrom. Uh, I would have a, a two questions on it. One's a macro question. Can a, is it wise for a team to build its payroll around two older starters who will both take up probably near records or record uh, uh, salaries to do it? And the second one is, do you think this player really wants to be a New York Met? Sure. Um, so, uh, as far as the, you know, the first question is, you know, anchoring down a rotation with, uh, you know, more experienced, uh, starters, I don't want to sound ageist or anything like that, Joel. All right. But, uh, but, you know, leaning in the, in the direction of guys that have, you know, played for a while. Um, yeah, it can be done. Um, you know, you just need to make sure you have the reinforcements kind of behind them, but that's, that's no different than, than, than any level of uh of starting pitcher i mean i've been in situations or seen situations where you needed to use eight nine ten eleven twelve starting pitchers over the course of a season just you know somebody might just take a turn for a game uh, but you need to kind of have that depth built out you know regardless of uh regardless of who's anchoring or who's at the front end of that rotation um you know so so i don't think that's a uh impediment by any stretch of the imagination but the um, question that i was specifically asking billy is that will probably take 80 million plus on just two players to get it done is that a why what, what whatever volume that steve Cohn gives you and i'm sure he'll give you a very large payroll to deal with is that a wise thing to do for two guys one who will pitch i believe at 35 next year the other whom will pitch at 38 next year is that a wise use of even a, a very large payroll 
Well, I mean, I, I'm not going to get into the forecasts on on what you think they would make or how those deals would kind of come into place. Um, so, uh, you know, everything has a balance to it. So if you're going to invest more in, in the starting pitching, you might have to look into the trade market to see if there's, uh, you know, an avenue to get something more cost controlled. Um, you know, there's an element of Robin Peter to pay Paul um, if you're going to allocate a lot of resources into one particular area of your roster. Uh, but I think, you know, the 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 best approach is to be opportunistic, um, to try to forecast player performance moving forward. And if it fits, um, then uh, then, you know, be willing to take it down. And so that's it's a, that's a little bit more of the approach that that, you know, that we would walk into the offseason with. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that, that's it. That's it on those, on you know, on those pitchers. I want to do a little bit broader on the rotation. Uh, obviously, you have uh, three great starters. Uh, Joel mentioned uh, Jake um, as a free agent. Two others, free agents, Bassett and Walker. Um, where do you think you stand right now in terms of the rotation, which was obviously very, very good last year, thanks to the yeah. signings? Um, you, you've got potentially, I guess, Peterson and McGill to go with Scherzer. Uh, Carrasco did throw 150 innings. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you want to say exactly, but uh, I would think, you know, unless there's something we don't know, you know, he's got, I guess, a $14 million option with a $3 million buyout. You yeah. might lean toward bringing him back, which would alleviate a little bit of a problem. But uh, where do you think you stand? Which starters do you have now? And uh, how urgent is it that you sign? Is it two? Is it three? Uh, it was a good situation last year. You had more depth than almost anybody. That said, you still you do have three free agents plus the Carrasco decision, which, as I said, looks like a lean toward keep. But I'd rather have you talk about it. Yeah, no. Um, so you know, one of the things I I stare at every day or multiple times a day is, um, and it's actually right up in front of me right now. It's just uh, that depth chart that I was referring to. With, you know, the the major league roster and then Triple A and Double A, and um, you know, right now you can you can you know, seizures are on it. Um, we have a decision to make on Carrasco. Uh, Peterson and McGill both, um, you know, showed uh, showed well this year. Uh, Peterson throwing, you know, more innings and, um, you know, being able to take more turns in the rotation. Um, is it a guarantee? I, I wouldn't call it a guarantee, but he really put himself in a, in a great spot. Um, was really happy with, with how he continued to develop and emerge. Um, you know, bringing Joey Lucchese back from, from Tommy John this year, um, and, and, you know, taking a, you know, a, a, a thoughtful approach to the rehabilitation uh, to make sure he's in he's in the best position uh, going into spring training next season as, as a starter. Um, Jose Budo, um, you know, actually had to make a spot start. Um, he was one of the spot starts I was referring to earlier um, on an earlier question. But but, you know, having Budo around um, and, you know, seeing his him, you know, him continuing to develop. Tyler McGill, who you just talked about. Um, and then, yeah, there's going to have to be some some supplementing to that group from the outside and in free agency um, or the trade market um, and perhaps both. So, um, you know, we want to build into a situation where we have walk into the year and we feel like there's seven or eight, eight people that we can, you know, count on to take, um, a, you know, a handful of starts if necessary. You know, that that just makes you feel a little bit more comfortable in our chair. And let's not let's not forget also Trevor Williams. You know, he made a couple spots, um, uh, a couple starts this this year, and and you know really really helped us, um, you know, in a number of situations, uh, you know, kind of save the uh, save the rest of the bullpen um, and giving us a chance to maybe w win the next day. I remember, uh, you know, one of the one of the comebacks in, that we had in, in Philly, um, you know, Trevor pitched the, the day before um, and uh, you know ate up a lot of. Uh, you know, ate up a lot of innings and, and put us in a position where we were armed the very next day. And, you know, Buck told me the story about coming off the field um, and walking up the tunnel and he was walking with Trev and he goes, Hey, I know you didn't pitch today, but you made today possible with what you did yesterday. Um, and so, you know, everybody counts, everybody, um, you know, everybody was important in, in, in driving, you know, this season and, and, you know, getting us to the place where we, you know, accomplished the number of wins that we accomplished, but um, we want to make sure we have that, um, that kind of starting depth and that pitching depth to be able to uh, to endure these, you know, long stretches of, of, you know, consecutive games. You mentioned your win total was 101. Uh, and we know you'll you'll have a large payroll again. It is interesting for a team that won 101 games led for most of the year. You have a lot of uncertainty going into this offseason. You mentioned 
uh, some of the depth for your rotation, but it's mainly untested or coming back from injury depth, very little kind of settled. I think your only uh, experience reliever coming back right now is Drew Smith. You know, Jeff McNeil led the league in hitting. Uh, you had two MVP candidates with with really good health. Uh, do you and and to John's point earlier, you went five for five on free agency. It's not something you do often, where you could do that off season after off season. I just wonder, do you feel this is a little more unsettled because you don't have a mature farm system ready to pop and definitely help you, especially in pitching? Do you feel unsettled even with a hundred one team and a large payroll? Um. You know, you can use the word unsettled. I can use the word. I think it's a it's an opportunity. Um, and and you know, there's a number of different ways that we can go to 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 fill this out. Like I said earlier, like it can go into the trade market, it can go into the free agency market. Um, uh, but you know, in my end of the season kind of address, you know, I had I had mentioned that you know Steve talked about you know using money to kind of bridge that gap while you do you know as you pointed out you know allow your farm system to mature. Um, I'm proud of the, the the players that are in our farm system and and the steps that they've you know taken to kind of move forward um, over this over this past year. Always looking to be better there. Always looking to improve processes there. Um, but you know this this off season will provide a lot of different opportunities for us to go a number of different ways. Um, whether that's into you know the trade or free agency, um, you know remains to be seen. But but you know there'll be there'll be conversations in, on both those fronts. Joel mentioned uh, two. Uh, MVP candidates on your team. I'm sure he was thinking of Lindor and Alonzo. I actually think you had three MVP candidates. Uh, Diaz, who uh, was fantastic this year, probably, probably not even probably, the best relief pitcher in baseball. Uh, some people do think that uh, relief is kind of a gamble, though, that uh, the one guy could have a great year one year, may not be so great the next, but uh, looking at the season that you had, it would not have been the same. It would not have been the same season without Edwin Diaz. He is a free agent, you know, looking at it, you know, we're in the clubhouse. We don't know these guys that well personally, but Diaz looks like a guy who loves it there. You know, I wouldn't say that for all the free agents, but he looks like a guy who really loves it there. How important is, and obviously Adovino was terrific, and Lugo's been very good for the team as well, and I'm sure you'd like to bring them all back, but how how important is it for you to bring uh, Diaz back? I'm sorry to sound like his agent, but he was great this year. Or he really was. Yeah, no no problem. Uh, Edwin was was nothing short of, of fantastic, um, you know, this, this season, and and it was, it was you know, very comforting to watch him, you know, come, come running into a game. Um, I really appreciate it. I know Buck did too, that, you know, the usability in some different roles. We saw him pitch um, in the eighth inning a number of times um, over the course of the season. And, and uh, you know, he was a, he was a, a very reliable um, and impactful player for us uh, over the course of the season. And so, um, you know, would we like to have him back? Absolutely. Um, are we going to be able to get something worked out? Potentially. Um, you know, but, uh, you know, he's reached a point in his, uh, in his career where, um, you know, he's, he's afforded himself the opportunity, um, with some, you know, the ability to, to look around if he so chooses, but, um, you know, he knows how we feel about him and, and, and we know how he feels about us, um, and how, um, you know, comfortable he was this year. He expressed that, um, I, I, I'm not sure he's just, uh, expressed it specifically to Buck. Maybe he did, but I passed it along because, you know, when I was talking with his, his agent, um, you know, he, he mentioned that. And so, um, you know, Edwin's Edwin can provide a big, uh, you know, a big boost to, uh, to, to the bullpen. And like I said, be used in a number of roles. And so, um, you know, but we'll see what, uh, we'll see what the, the coming days and coming weeks uh, provides. Billy, one of the commonality of teams that are played in the playoffs or made big jumps this year was strong defensive catching. Like if you look in the world series, Right now, uh, you know, uh, Houston plays a guy who could hardly hit in Maldonado, but he's so good on one side of the ball, real muto on both. Big jumps this year by Baltimore with Rutschman, Seattle with uh, Raleigh. You have one of the better young catch, probably the best young catching prospect in the sport who got a little cameo late in the season. I don't think people have doubts about one side of the ball, which is his offense. But are you ready to hand over a pennant contending team and pitching staff to also usually catchers don't start quite as young as he would at 21. Is he ready for a hundred say start uh, catching load in 2023? 
Well, that remains to be seen. He's got to earn his way on. Um, and uh, you know, and kind of kind of force his way, you know, onto the roster. And so um, you know, what we did see with Francisco this year was improvement on, on the defensive side. And, you know, one of the things that we look about is it will look at very closely is the receiving ability of the catcher. Um, and we can we can judge that both, you know, subjectively and objectively. Um, and kind of converging both of those uh, opinions, you know, gave us some some comfort. And, you know, um, that's ultimately why we ended up moving him to to AAA um, in addition to his offensive performance. Um, then once once we got to a spot where, um, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was he was feeling comfortable with, you know, the ankle injury. And, and then, um, you know, we kind of got that into a spot where where some of the discomfort went away and we saw what his bat did in triple a in a very short amount of time, but it was, it was good to see that, um, you know, but ultimately Francisco is going to have to come and, and push his way onto the roster. Um, so are we comfortable turning it over? You know, if, if he forces that issue, that'll be a conversation for that time. Um, it's not a conversation for right now, but I have tremendous faith in, in Glenn Sherlock and his ability to um, really center the focus of, you know, all, all of our catchers um, on the on the defensive side of the game. Um, we we did see improvement uh, with both McCann and Nito uh, this season on the defensive side as well. So uh, I, I would trust that that Francisco would in, enjoy kind of that same, um, you know, that that same level of improvement that, uh, you know, Glenn's been able to, uh, you know, to realize with uh, with even more seasoned players. So um, but time will tell. I'm going to go to the outfield situation now. Obviously, Brandon Nimmo, another of your free agents. You've got uh, a lot of them and uh, very, very good players. Uh, he's really worked himself into a great position. The last three years were very good. Uh, this year, he was uh, very healthy. He stayed on the field. Obviously, in the past, that was a little bit of a a little bit of a question. He's now hired Scott Boris as his agent. And I mean, he looks like he loves it in New York, but as you said, you know, now is free agent time and they have the ability to look around. So there are no guarantees. One other reason that he's in good position though, is that there aren't really a lot of other or any other comparable center fielders on the market. Um, so I want to ask you do, you, do you think if you had to, could Marte, you, would you be comfortable with Marte going back to center field and then, perhaps acquiring a right fielder. And I know you probably won't speak about Aaron judge, but just, you know, wink twice if you're interested in Aaron judge, or if that's a possibility. Wink three times. It's Michael Conforto come back. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Uh, I, I, you know, just like a law of nature, I'm going to have to blink. You realize that, okay? So, right. <laughs> That's exactly why I asked it that but way. But we're going to read it as we're going to read it as Morse code, Billy, and interpret it the way we want to interpret it. Well, and generally, could you sign a right fielder and, uh, yeah, you know, move Marte to center field? Would that be comfortably? Obviously, he was a great center fielder at one time. You moved him to right. Obviously, the team felt Marte was better in right and Nemo in center. Nemo, it worked out great. Can Marte go? Go back to center if you have to. Um, yeah, we believe he can. Um, you know, part of the part of the you know rationale for signing Marte wasn't so much that he was you know a, a center fielder. You know, this this outfield is not an easy one to play. Um, you know, and and our ballpark suppresses home runs. I, we all realize and acknowledge that. And so, you know, depending on the year, it could be the 26, 27, 28, You know, most difficult. Um, park to hit a home run in and so that that leaves a lot of opportunities for balls to to land in the outfield and 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 fall short of the wall and so you know having above average defense now that all three um you know all three positions was it was important to me it was important to buck um and so you know can starling still play center field yeah we believe he can um so it that that opens up some optionality for how we ultimately you know would fill out that outfield um, but that being said, it's not, you know, it's not a, a, a closed case by any, by any stretch of the imagination. So, um, you know, Brandon knows, uh, knows how we feel. Um, we know how he feels too. Um, so perhaps something can, can get accomplished there. Um, but, uh, but we do have a, the ability to, to slide, uh, Marte over and in, over into center, um, for, 
you know, a, a number of games for, you know, over 50% of the games that, you know, I, he's got that ability to do that. He's shown it in the past and he was moving well, um, you know, this, this season, um, you know, or earlier on kind of before that, uh, before that like quad uh, quad issue or groin issue that he, that he went through, but all in all um, we are comfortable with him in center field. Billy uh, in the last few weeks, uh, you know, Sandy Alderson uh, is no longer going to be the, team president somebody has to be hired for that position David Stearns announced he was stepping down as running baseball operations in Milwaukee he said he's staying there you know I tend to not believe stuff like that you know we'll see if he actually stays there or not uh for the for the year so I just have two questions do you think somebody is going to be brought in above you who will have a lot to say in baseball operations either as the president or in another role and does it bother you at all that this is a subject one year into your term and you won 101 games? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm focused on the job and I'm not thinking about any more than that at this time. I think, um, you know, Steve had a, had a, had a comment last week um, when that news happened, but you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I've texted with David and, and he and I, you know, have a relationship stand, you know, going back through the years to when he was in Houston and I was, uh, you know, across uh, the cross the town with with the Yankees and stuff. So, but right now it's time to just focus on the job. I'm not thinking about any more than that um, at this time. So, but but are you a sh you sure you are doing this job where you're the lead voice of baseball operations this off season? Yeah, yeah, that's you know one of the conversations that uh, you know we that Steve and I have talked about is that um, there's nothing on the horizon. He told me. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to handle it. So that's, uh, you know, that's what's been messaged to me. And that's how I'm just focused about the job. Well, you did a great overall job this year, win 101 games, rare to go five for five in free agency, but obviously the ending isn't what uh, any of the Mets fans wanted. What, what do you think happened at the end? Did some guys just run out of gas? Obviously the National League was going to be a very difficult gauntlet. It, ended up being a big surprise a team that you beat 14 out of 19 times is in the world series uh what do you think happened at the end why wasn't it the ending that Mets fans were hoping for and are you shocked like I am and probably Joel and certainly Keith Hernandez is that it's the Philadelphia Phillies who were lucky <laughs> to win f even five games against you guys this year you just manhandled them um what do you think of all that yeah, well, um, you know, start with the, the the back end. You know, Phillies was a was a really strong team. Um, they're a very dangerous team. Uh, that 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 lineup, um, you know, over the course of the season was going to put up some runs and 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 be impactful. And you know, they had some some starting pitching at the front end that can you know they can really do some things. Um, and so, um, you know, and I got a little personal connection with, with Rob Thompson and Kevin Long. And I'm, I'm happy for um, the success that they're, that they're having down there. And um, you know, so, um, and you get into the postseason, right. Anything can happen. It's an exciting format, um, you know? And so, um, you know, this is ultimately they, they, they played the best at this moment in time and they're deserving of where they are uh, because of how they've played. So, um, and then, uh, John, remind me again. What was the first part of that question? The ending. What do you think happened to, to the team? Because the team was yeah. so good, and then you just really had to win one game in Atlanta to yeah. not have to go through what, what is, you know, three games, anything can happen. Yeah. All the teams were good in the National League. So I think they just ran out of gas a little bit. Um, what, what could it be? Because the team was great up until the last week. Yeah, I mean, you know, like timing and sequencing matters a lot in things, right? Um, you know, I th thought, get a lot of thought about this, um, you know, over the course of the last month of the season. And then, you know, especially even more so once we haven't, uh, once we haven't been playing and, you know, our, 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 our pitching, um, you know, wasn't at the point um, that it was, uh, you know, over the course of the season. And those things happen. Right. And nobody goes out and makes 32 starts or 30 starts and they're all electric. Um, and so, you know, there's a sequencing component to things. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that that played into it and it was just, um, you know, it was just it was just a timing, a timing thing. But, um, you know, it was, uh, 
you know, not the way that we wanted to end, but um, we sure felt really good about how the how the whole season played out um, and uh, or how the whole season, um, uh, you know, was was was, you know, was 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 put together um, and 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 the the things that this this group, you know, achieved, um, you know, whether it was some historic comebacks, whether it was, you know, some stretches of, of winning a lot of games in a row or conversely you know, not losing a lot of games in a row. It was a resilient club. Um, it was, it was a fun season to watch, fun season to be a part of. And I'm, I'm really proud of everybody, you know, and everybody's efforts. Um, that, that's not just the players and that's not just the coaching staff or the performance staff. That's everybody's hand that goes into, you know, putting together a, a season and a, and a baseball operation. Um, so I, I'm, I'm really proud of, of the steps that we've made. I just wanted to finish up on a couple of specifics. If you could enlighten us, um, one is, I think we touched on uh, the outfield and uh, right field. I've seen it's going to be moved in. Uh, I don't know if it's going to be like Baltimore where they moved it out 26 and a half feet. Uh, can you, it, I think I saw it slightly. Uh, what does slightly mean? Does that mean 10 feet? It's moved, being moved in in right field generally. And also uh, I touched on it. I don't think you really specifically answered, but Carrasco, can you say, uh, you know, because I think fans are nervous about the rotation right now because we only have one definite and we got two possibilities. Is Carrasco likely to be brought back? Yeah, I'm not, not going to say right now on, on Carlos. Sorry. We'll just uh, we'll, we'll wait till we, uh, you know, get to the point where we're, we have to, you know, make a decision on that, whether to exercise or, or not. Um, so we'll probably take that up you know, closer to that deadline. And then, um, you know, they have the, f the fence will be moving slightly in, um, in, in right field. Uh, I'm not going to get into a, a ton of detail on it right now, but, um, but that is something that's, um, you know, on the horizon and, um, you know, I, what kind of impact it's going to have, I, I don't think it's going to be too material. Um, so, um, but yeah, that is, uh, that is something we're doing to kind of enhance the fan. It's uh, Billy, I I'd finish up by just following up on that. Is this being done uh, for a fan experience or for a baseball reason to get, you mentioned earlier in it that it's very difficult to cover the ground defensively and very difficult to hit the ball out of the ballpark. Is mm -hmm. this being done to enhance a fan experience, make more things possible or yes. to help yeah, your baseball? Club? No, for the, for the fan experience. And it's not going to run at a detriment. Like I said, it's not going to have a material effect. Um, you know, at least at the, uh, you know, at least at the early kind of renderings um, and, and, and work behind it. So, uh, but it will enhance the fan experience. So it has nothing to do with trying to lure judge to, uh, to the Mets then. <laughs> We're wrapping up Billy, you know, <laughs> if you really want to enhance the fan experience, you could tell us your off season plans. You know, it's a lot of home runs to right field. The same. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Land the plane, John. Let's go. Come on, man. <laughs> Joel's in charge. Joel's the pilot. I'm just in uh, seat eight, eight B, the middle. All, All right. right. Well, we'll 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 send some peanuts back for you, John. Uh, Billy, we appreciate you so much uh, joining yep. the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman, and we'll be back right after this. All right, guys. Be well. Thanks. So, John, Billy Epler covered a lot of ground there about his team, about his offseason. What stuck with you? Well, I thought it was interesting the way he responded on the Marte question. He did say he thinks he can play center field. Um, he didn't say he thinks he can be the full-time starting center fielder, and we're thrilled with it. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading between the lines there, but he said he felt he could be a center fielder. And so that is an option if they don't get Nimmo back to go for right field. But to me, I think – my guess is they prefer to keep Marte in right field if they can. Yeah, there's no doubt about that to me, because I think in your question, you framed it well, which is there just are not a lot of center fielders out in the market. It's why I think you and I both expect that Nimmo is going to get a lot more money than the average fan who's looking at it is going to say, wow, wait, uh, you know, it's what's rare is valuable. And there's a scarcity and even if the Mets do not bring back Nimmo and put Marte in center field, they better have a good caddy to keep those mid 30 year old legs uh, fresh for Marte. We saw what the lineup looked like without him this year. So you want to be able to keep him fresh. So they have to find a center fielder who's at least a one a, even if Marte goes to goes to the position. So I think it, it makes it tricky for the Mets. They like we covered in the thing, John. They won 101 games, but they have a lot of work to do this offseason to be that level of team 
and probably something we'll talk about a lot this offseason, what they're doing. Next we talk, John, you and I will be at the general manager's meetings in Vegas. You'll listen to that. This is the show from the, uh, the New York Post. Uh, thanks to Jake Brown and Andrew Hartz for producing this show. Don't forget, every Wednesday by noon on the Yes app, the show drops in case you want to see how pretty John and I look. Uh, in this case, me from Philly, John from Miami. Don't forget to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a five-star rating on Apple and Spotify. Follow us on Twitter. He's at John Heyman. I'm at Joel Sherman 1. And please join us every week on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman.